covers uh, more ground than he did the first time around. It's great to have him on the show, and it's good to have him as a friend and a colleague. Bill, welcome to Stand to Reason. Welcome, Greg. Good to be with you. Thank you. You, you. It's so good to talk with you, and I've been thinking the last two weeks as I've read the reviews of Stephen Hawking's um, book, and I've had a chance to read some of it myself, and I listened to your podcast uh, uh, where you raised some questions. I listened to it four or five times, actually. I, I just kept thinking, I can't wait to talk to Bill to see what he has to say about this once he's had a chance to digest some of the ideas here. Are we facing anything new in the grand design? as far as you know, than uh, what we faced in his uh, previous book, A Brief History of Time? There's nothing new scientifically in this book, nothing new about the origin of the universe or about the fine-tuning of the universe, mm-hmm. nothing new in that respect as I anticipated. But what is new, Greg, in this book that I had not expected is that the first third of this book is devoted to a purely philosophical discussion of anti-realism mm. about the world. Mm-hmm. It is a radically postmodernist view of reality that Hawking and Lodinoff uh, lay out in the first third of this book. And this is so ironic, because on the first page of the book, they say philosophy is dead. <laughs> I know, they- I know. These are questions that were traditional philosophically answered, but now we will answer them as scientists. I, I and thought... then they launch into this discussion of this postmodernist uh, anti-realism. It's bizarre. I know. I, I saw that, and it's the first line of the second paragraph. Yes, and the book itself bears testimony to that fact. They cannot escape mm-hmm. philosophy in doing this book themselves. And so what they wind up doing is amateurish, Mm -hmm. bad philosophy. Well, was it Einstein who said scientists are poor philosophers? Yeah, it was. Albert Einstein and this, made that comment. The man of science is a poor philosopher. Yeah, and the, and and this this book is, is an example of this. And we don't mean at all, I mean, it's... And we're starting out this uh, conversation here, kind of gasping at how bad it's. It's the book itself starts out, and uh, we we don't mean to just be hurling epithets to to just diminish right. them and move on. But I, I want to go to the philosophy for just a moment that he presents in the beginning of the book, and I, I wonder if you could speak to this. He says. This is Stephen Hawking says that he uh, is a scientific determinist. That's the principle that that is that scientific laws determine everything in the future and every ha, everything that happened in the past, and he applies. And I don't know why he adds scientific to determinism because it seems to me like determinism is just determinism, you know. Um, but uh, he he uh, he applies this to human nature too. So, yeah. so there is there is only one kind of causation in his view, and that's event causation. There is no agency, certainly not of God, but no not of human beings as well. Uh, and what what stuns me is that on this view, then, if physics is everything, then physics would have to have to determine the order of the words in his own book. That's right, and not the laws of discursive reasoning and inference and logic and and yeah. the kind of thing. So, what does that make of his entire argument? If he that's what I wondered as I read this passage in the book, I thought, what confidence can they have that anything they have written in this book is true? since on their view they were just determined to write it. Mm -hmm. It's like water gushing from a pipe (laughs) or a branch growing out of a tree. They were just determined to write these Mm -hmm. things. So what confidence can they have that what they say is true? And in particular, what confidence can they have that their affirmation of determinism is true. Right, right. It undercuts itself. Yeah, uh, you know, and as I read, I've just read uh, up to the bullfish, the goldfish bowl Yeah, yeah uh, that's chapter. the anti-realism again. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that too, but I uh, just, as he lays down his foundation and, and then his assertion of scientific determinism, I did not get the sense that he has the slightest inkling of the difficulty that he has with the views he's just laid uh, and, and, and the hole that he's digging for himself. I'm sure you're right about that. I think it's very naive philosophically. But here's a further question I had, Greg. How do you square his affirmation of scientific determinism, which he associates, you may remember, with Laplace? Yes, that's right. Um, so this is a Laplacean determinism that goes back to Newtonian physics. Mm. How do you reconcile the affirmation of that kind of determinism with his view of quantum mechanics, 
which is indeterministic. Mm. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is a major contradiction that I frankly don't understand. Mm -hmm. And you can't just try to escape it by saying that quantum indeterminacy only operates on the subatomic level, because it's easy to amplify those subatomic effects to have macroscopic results. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I heard of an amusing illustration of this. Imagine a, a student who's working in the laboratory one night on, a, on an experiment, and he's delayed in leaving the lab because of the decay of a radioactive isotope that he's working with. Well, that's a quantum indeterminate process. Uh -huh. So he's delayed leaving the laboratory because it takes extra time to decay. As he leaves the laboratory, he runs into a girl in the hall whom he meets and eventually falls in love with and then marries. And so this quantum indeterminate event oh, yeah. has major macroscopic <laughs> yeah. results in the world. That's, that's and, and, good... it, it, and the fact is you can't affirm mm -hmm. scientific determinism if you're all going, also going to hold that quantum indeterminacy is ontic rather than just epistemic. That's... The thing that Penrose spots and protests in his review is precisely this wild anti-realism mm -hmm. of Hawking and Mladenov that we spoke of near the beginning of our interview. Yes, why don't you take a moment and explain what that is? For A lot of folks may not yeah. uh, be tracking with that okay. concept. What, what they hold is that there is no objective reality out there independent of our models of reality. And what a model is for them is a sort of way of organizing your sense perceptions that come into your brain through your five senses. And you organize these in some way. And they will say that there is no reality mm. about the way the world actually is. It's just these different ways of modeling it. These useful fictions, kind of. Yeah, that's right. All you can say is that one model is more convenient than another but it is not more correct or more accurate because, and it's not that we don't know the way reality is, Greg. On their view, there is no objective reality hmm. independent of these models. Hmm. So they actually say, get this, at one point in the book, that there is no objective fact of the matter whether the young earth creationist is right or the big bang cosmologist is right. Young Earth creationism and Big Bang cosmology wow. are equally valid models of reality, and it's meaningless to say which one describes the way the world really is, because it's just model dependent. And all we can say is that the Big Bang is a more convenient model well, than now, Young well, Earth creationism. It just it just seems to me that this is is like one contradiction after another. Oh, because this, this is just another way that his whole thesis is undermined, because what are we to make of his scientific determinism, which is the view that he doesn't argue for, but simply assumes, and he yeah. bases the, the larger part of his book on this notion. Uh, what are we, are we to take that as a, as a real or accurate depiction of the way the, the world actually is? No. I guess not. In no, light it's of just his model, and someone who has a model of the world that includes free agents is just as you know, valid is his view.